Uh, last time I explained very briefly how in uh, classical uh, electromagnetic theory uh, a system of charged particles in some state of motion have a magnetic moment vector and an angular momentum vector, which in general have no, uh, no simple relationship uh, among themselves. However, in some simple circumstances, such as a single charged particle moving in a circular orbit, if those two vectors are proportional, and the proportionality factor is Q over 2 mc, where Q is the charge of the particle. I also explained that if you go over to quantum mechanics, then this relationship, the, which gives the proportionality between the, uh, between the magnetic moment and the angular momentum, uh, actually carries over into quantum mechanics without modification, as long as you're talking about orbital angular momentum, which is what L, L usually means, orbital angular momentum. Uh, this is something we'll see in more detail later on when you consider the uh, Zeeman effect, and we'll see this come out explicitly. However, in the case of particles with spin, uh, the uh, relationship between the magnetic moment and, and the angular momentum, which is, uh, which is uh, traditionally called uh, S, is the, is the uh, spin or, or, or angular momentum vector for the intrinsic uh, magnetic moment of a particle. Uh, well, it still has a proportionality between the two, but it's necessary, in addition to this factor of Q over 2 mc, it's necessary to insert a fudge factor or a, uh, a so-called g factor, which is a dimensionless number that compensates for the, um, that uh, makes proportionality come out right. So different particles have different g factors, which I'll say more about in just, in just a moment. Now, before I do that, however, I should say something about spin, the intrinsic angular momentum of particles. It's generally true that elementary particles have an intrinsic angular momentum, that is to say, an angular momentum in addition to the so-called orbital angular momentum that they have because of their motion through space. Um, the fact that there isn't such an angular momentum there is revealed in many different ways. But one of them is that um, in order to get conservation of, of angular momentum for systems that are rotationally invariant, it's necessary to include the spin angular momentum as well as the orbital angular momentum. Otherwise, you don't have conservation of angular momentum. In addition, one sees it through the magnetic effects with the magnetic moments. Uh, taking the electron for, for an example is a very crude model. If you want to think about spin, you can think of the electron not as a point particle, but rather as a small sphere, charged sphere, which is spinning on its axis. This would uh, clearly give rise to an angular momentum. And because of the charge, it would also involve a current, and the current would give rise to a magnetic moment. So this little crude model would uh, allow you to see why there's both magnetic moments and angular momentum. However, this model is extremely crude, I want to warn you, and, and it's not really suitable for uh, anything quantitative. It's just, just as a way of giving you a picture of thinking uh, about what spin means. Now, that's how it is for elementary particles. As I explained at, at last hour, uh, if you have a composite particle, such as a proton, which is made up of uh, quarks and uh, made up out of quarks, uh, then what we call the spin of such a particle, the proton, uh, is really the sum of the orbital in, as well as spin and the momentum of the constituent particles. Same thing can be said for other composite particles, such as nuclei. Uh, for example, uh, an, uh, a deuteron is a bound state of a proton and a neutron, each of which has spin one half. And in addition, there's some orbital angular momentum. It's a two-body problem, a proton and neutron orbit around each other. And in addition, there's some orbital angular momentum. And the sum total of all of this gives an angular momentum of one, which is considered the spin of deuteron. Uh, you can do the same thing with atoms. If you have an atom, for example, a hydrogen atom in the ground state has a spin of zero. That's because the proton and electron spins are aligned opposite one another in the ground state, giving a total spin of zero and the electron orbital angular momentum is zero as well. So the ground state of a hydrogen is, is really a, is a big problem, is a spin zero particle. All right. Now, uh, when we're talking quantum mechanics, of course, uh, the, uh, the magnetic moment and the angular momentum have to be reinterpreted as operators. Uh, they have to act on some Hilbert space because they're observables, both of them. And uh, the question is, what is the Hilbert space? Uh, well, in the case of a, uh, of, a, of a solar atom, we discussed this earlier in connection with the strand Verloc apparatus. And by analyzing the experimental results, we decided that the Hilbert space was two-dimensional. If I call the Hilbert space E, this is a way of saying that it consists of two component complex vectors, or in mathematical language, this is a space C2, like this. And it turns out that for particles, whether they're elementary or not, 
uh, it turns out that the Hilbert space corresponding to the spin degrees of freedom, that is to say the Hilbert space upon which the spin operator acts, in general is a space consisting of what we call spinners. These are uh, complex vectors with 2s plus 1 components. We can write this this way, c to the 2s plus 2, excuse me, c to the 2s plus 1, where s is a lowercase s, not to be confused with capital S, the spin operator. The lowercase s is, is what you call the spin of the particle. It's an angular momentum quantum number, and therefore is either a, an integer or a half integer, and it characterizes the particle. So the Hilbert space upon which the spin operator, operator acts is a, is in the language I introduced last time, is what you call a, uh, an irreducible subspace under rotations. Uh, I'll remind you an irreducible subspace is a set of, is a space which is spanned by a set of vectors jm, where the m values go from minus j to plus j. They're connected by raising and lowering operators. So it's a space that has dimension 2j plus 1. Now, uh, I mentioned that in the sort of general system, it's necessary to introduce, in general, an extra index gamma in case there's a degeneracy if the j and m values don't, don't uniquely specify a state. Uh, for spin systems, the extra index gamma is not necessary because there's only one irreducible subspace. In the case of the electron, we just have two component spinners. We don't have pairs of two component spinners with different other quantum numbers lying around. And the same thing is true for spins of other values of the spin quantum numbers as well. So for the deuteron, for example, you have a three, it uh, becomes C3, so three component spinners because the spin is only one. All right. And so uh, a basis for the spin Hilbert space is basically a standard angular momentum basis, except we don't need the index gamma, so I'll cross it out. And also we use a change in notation. We indicate the angular momentum by a symbol S because it's spin, and otherwise the magnetic number, quantum number is still M. You can put an S subscript on it if you want to indicate that it's the magnetic uh, quantum number corresponding to the spin angular momentum. All right, so these are basis vectors in the Hilbert space. And therefore, the matrices, for example, that represent the spin operators are the matrices in the standard angular momentum basis, which I went over in lecture last time, I believe. For example, for a Deuteron, which has a spin of one, these are the three by three matrices acting on these, uh, acting on the space spanned by these vectors. For a spin one half particle, they become two by two matrices. Those are proportional to the poly matrices. All right. So that explains, uh, at least that's the basic facts about the uh, Hilbert space for, um, for, uh, for spin systems. Now, uh, let me switch to a new board, and I'll say something about G factors. I'll just do this by running through some examples. Let's take, the, first of all, the case of the electron, which is probably the uh, place to begin, the most important particle. Uh, the electron, uh, it has a charge Q equals minus E. So the rule is that the magnetic moment is the G factor times minus E over 2MC uh, multiplied times the spin operator like this. <coughs> the, uh, this is the electron mass here, and it's the electron G factor, so I'll put E subscripts on that. Uh, the spin operator is, of course, has dimensions of uh, angular momentum, uh, which is the same as H bar. So if you make something which is dimensionless, I'll divide that by h bar and multiply the prefactor also by h bar. And if we do this, then what we get is a factor here of, of, of e h bar of 2 m c like this. This is a this has, as you see, must have units of magnetic moment since what's left over the g and the s over h bar are dimensionless. And uh, this is in fact called the this is a standard unit of, mag uh, of magnetic moment e h bar of 2 m 2 m e c and it's called the Bohr magneton. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the B subscript here refers to Bohr. It's a standard unit of, uh, of, uh, of angular momentum when talking about uh, electron systems. Uh, so we can write this then as uh, minus GE times the Bohr magneton times the spin S over H bar, like this. <coughs> Now, about the g-factor for the electron, the g-factor is, is equal to the following value. It's can be written this way. It's 2 times the number, which is 1.0011 dot, dot, dot. It's very closely equal to 2. It's 2 with a small correction. In fact, the g-factor equal to 2 uh, is something that emerges automatically from the Dirac equation. 
which is the relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation for an electron, which we'll study in the next semester. And the fact that it automatically gives you the g factor of 2 is considered one of the greatest of successes of the Dirac equation. It's very, very interesting how it comes out. Uh, of course, you can also measure it. And when you do measure it, you find that there's a, a small corrections to this that's not exactly equal to 2. Uh, these small corrections can be derived by theory. This is uh, actually the beginning of a perturbation expansion, and it looks like this. It's 1 plus alpha over 2 pi plus higher order terms, where alpha here is the fine structure constant. It's e squared over h bar c, which is about 1 over 137, approximately this. And this is the uh, small parameter which is used in quantum molecular dynamics for carrying out perturbation expansions. Uh, the uh, extra corrections which appear here are not, are not a part of the standard Dirac equation. Uh, they involve physics which is not contained in the Dirac equation. But what that physics is, is the interaction of the electron with the quantized electromagnetic field and also with the quantized uh, positron electron field. When all those things are taken into account, then you can ca actually calculate these corrections. These corrections are also called radiated corrections because they involve the um, the emission and absorption of virtual photons and also the creation of virtual electron positron pairs. All right, so uh, to summarize this, for the electron, there's good theory for predicting, uh, for calculating the G factors, and it works, it works very well. In fact, there's been a competition between theory and experiment to push these, this series or this number, measured experimentally in the series theoretically, up to higher and higher uh, accuracy. I don't know what the score is right now, but I think it's approaching, if not more, than 10 significant digits. So there's a um, very good agreement between theory and experiment. The reason for doing this is to push QED, quantum molecular dynamics, as far as possible to see, hopefully, one would find some breakdown at some point and learn about new physics. But as far as I know, it, it, hasn't, it has not actually happened yet. All right. But in any case, uh, this is the basic story about the G factors of electrons. Notice that there's a minus sign here. It comes from the fact that the electron is a negative particle, and it means the electron magnetic moment in its spin point in opposite directions. One final remark is, is that S divided by H bar, in the case of an electron, is the same thing as one half of the poly matrix C sigma. So this can also be written as GE over 2 times the Bohr magneton times the poly matrices. This is another way of writing the electron magnetic moment. I better put a minus sign on it, too. And since GE is approximately equal to 2, if we make the approximation that, that G is, is equal to 2, then this becomes very nearly minus the four magneton is multiplied times sigma. It's a rather simple result for the uh, magnetic moment of, of the electron. Now, um, the next particle I'll talk about is the positron. Uh, the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. It's an E plus. So it has a charge Q is equal to plus E. And so the relation is that the magnetic moment of the positron is equal to G times uh, EH bar over 2MC times S divided by the S divided by H bar, like this. The only, and this is the electron mass because the electron and positron have the same mass. They also have the same G factor because they are the <coughs> particles of one another. And the only difference is the sign. So in the case of the positron, all the electron formulas apply except you have a plus sign instead of a minus sign. But in that case, the angular momentum and magnetic moment point in the same direction. All right, so that's the story of the positron. Let's move on to the proton, the next most interesting particle. A proton is a spin one half particle. And um, the magnetic moment following the general formula is going to be equal to the g factor, this, in this case, for the proton. Since the charge Q is equal to plus E, we get e, uh, EH bar over 2MC two MC, two MC times the spin divided by H bar to make the spin part dimensionless, except now this is the proton mass which appears here and not the electron mass. Uh, this is a quantity EH bar over 2MC is called, is noted mu sub N, and it's called a nuclear magneton because it's a, uh, it's a, a convenient, uh, if I, I, I can't spell things while I'm, while I'm talking. Uh, it's a nuclear magneton, and uh, it is a, uh, a, uh, a convenient unit for discussing magnetic moments of uh, protons, neutrons, and nuclei, which are made up out of protons and neutrons. 
because of the proton mass which appears here in comparison to the electron mass for the uh, for the uh, for the Bohr magneton, wherever it is right here, the nuclear magneton is about uh, 2,000 times smaller than the electric in the uh, than the Bohr magneton. One of the consequences of this is that if you have an atom which has unpaired electrons, so that there is some magnetic moment of the electrons which is uh, remaining, then the electron magnetic moment is going to dominate the total magnetic moment of the atom. The nuclear magnetic moment will be a very small correction to it, at a level of about one part per thousand or less. Uh, if you want to really see nuclear magnetic moments in a clean way, it's best to use an atom in which the uh, electron spins are paired because then uh, there is no, uh, and, and the orbital angle of them has, is to zero, because in that case, the nuclear magnetic, uh, magnetic moment is the only thing left. Um, all right. Uh, anyway, that's the nuclear magnetic moment. Now, about the, the G factor for the proton, it has a value of about 5.588, some number like this. And um, the accuracy of that number is due to the fact that people measured it experimentally. There is no uh, theory at the present time which is able to predict this number out to any high accuracy as there was for the case of the electron. And the reason for this is, is that it involves the strong interactions and it's very difficult to do calculations in the strong interactions. There are simple models of quarks and antiquarks put together that go back to the earliest days of the quark theory back in the 1960s, which are able to predict the magnetic moments of the uh, of the proton and neutron and the other baryons to within about 5% accuracy. So it's sort of not bad for a first step. However, to improve it beyond that is very difficult and uh, involves, nowadays people are doing enormous computer calculations with last QCD and so on. One of the things they want to get is a more accurate prediction of the magnetic moments is test of QED. But the basic fact is, is these numbers are fundamentally experimental. Um, all right. Now, uh, by the way, since this, fact, this magnetic moment does not have the Dirac factor of two, the two that comes out of the relativistic Dirac equation, people call these magnetic moments, sometimes they call them anomalous, meaning not predicted by Dirac. Of course, one could say that even the electron is anomalous too if you include the radiated corrections, because it's not exactly the value of two either. But anyway, it's very close to it. Uh, the case of the neutron is also interesting. Neutron is a neutral particle, so Q is equal to zero. Uh, and nevertheless, it still has a magnetic moment, even though the charges cancel out from the quarks and their motion. The magnetic moments don't, and there's a net magnetic moment left over. And the magnetic moment of the neutron is written this way. It's mu is equal to the g factor of the neutron. By convention, we use the nuclear magneton, that is to say with the proton mass in here, so it becomes EH bar over twice m of PC as a factor here, and then the spin over H bar. I didn't mention this, but the proton has a spin of one half, just like just like just like the proton does. So S over H bar in both cases is the same thing as one half sigma, for both the proton and the neutron. And the neutron G factor, Gn, is equal to with a minus sign about 3.8 something, I forget the exact number. And to say that it's negative means that the magnetic moment and the spin are in opposite directions for the neutron. And um, uh, that's basically the story of the magnetic moment for the neutron. Even though we, we use the charge here, of the, the, the unit of the quantum, the quantum unit of charge here is quite the fact that the neutron is neutral. That's just a set of conventions. So if you talk about the next case, if I talk about the deuteron, the deuteron is, is a bound state of the proton and neutron, and it has a spin equals to 1. So in this case, the magnetic moment mu is equal to the g factor of the deuteron times the charge, which is E h bar over, and again, we use the Bohr, we use, excuse me, we use the nuclear magneton here, E h bar over 2 mpc with the proton mass in it. This is the standard unit of magnetic moment for all nuclei that people use. And then what's left over is S over H bar, like this. However, now notice that since the spin is equal to one, the spin operators are represented by three by three matrices and not two by two anymore. So for the Deuteron, you have to take that into account. The G factor for the Deuteron is about 0 0.8 something, 0 0.85, I think the exact number. I don't understand the justification for using, like, starting at the neutron. If, um, 
Q is zero. We started out with the formula for magnetic moment depending on the Q of that particle that you're talking about. And we go with the justification of Q. Why didn't I just, why didn't I carry that all the way through? Yeah. Well, if I did, I'd end up with a zero magnetic moment for the neutron, and it doesn't work. So, that it doesn't work. Excuse me? That would seem to me like, oh, well, this formula must be wrong. Well, the formula in the first place was a fudge factor based on a formula borrowed from classical mechanics, which isn't even true all the time in classical mechanics. Right. So we're feeling our way as we go. That's one thing to say. Another thing to say is, is that, uh, the nuclear magneton, which is used here, which involves the photon mass, is, is just used as a matter of convenience, as a convenient unit for magnetic moment in the case of, in the case of nuclear particles. So it's, it's just a unit that's, that's logical to use, so that you can easily compare magnetic moments with different nuclear particles. And it, the fact is that, that the neutron has a magnetic moment in spite of not having a charge, because as I said, the charges cancel, but the magnetic moments don't. It's a composite particle and there's dynamics inside. Okay? That's the really the logic of it. Anyway, there's some, a lot of conventions in how this is set up, but that's that this is how it works. Yes? In the deuteron, why isn't the mass doubled? Well, again, it's the same thing. I could double the mass if I wanted to follow the original formula. But the reason it's not done is because uh, is because the nuclear magneton, as I said, is, is just chosen as a convenient unit of magnetic moment for all nuclear particles. That way you can compare different particles without having different mass factors. Bohr um, magneton applies to an electron, but if you talk about magnetic moments of atoms, you're going to find that it's not necessarily the Bohr magneton. The atom has mass, of course, which is much more than the electron. So it's, again, it's a similar story. One uses Bohr magneton when talking about atomic, uh, atomic magnetic moments due to the electrons. But a, 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 the G factor is not, not necessarily equal to two because there's, there's, and there's orbital angular momentum, there's coupling in the electrons, it's, it can be more complicated stories. We'll get into that when I talk about the Zeeman effect. You'll see that there's other, see, you probably have seen it already, Landau, the, uh, uh, the, uh, that's not Landau, it's the, uh, When you get to be my age, your, your brain stops remembering names. It's the longer effective G, the effective G factors in, in the case of, of atoms, the weak magnetic fields. We'll come back to that when we look at the same effect. All right. So there's a what's good? Which? Lande. Yeah, Lande. I knew it started with L. Yes, Lande. Lande is a G factor. Yeah, we'll come back to that. All right. So this is the basic facts about uh, magnetic moments. Now, what about the Hamiltonian describing the evolution of magnetic moments and spins? Uh, I mentioned at the class of level, the force on a magnetic dipole is given by the gradient of mu dotted into V. Mu is the characteristic of the particle, and V is a function in general of space and time. And uh, so if we write this as minus the gradient of W to make it look like a potential, then the W potential energy is minus mu dot v, and this is the potential energy which is usually ascribed to a, a magnetic dipole in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in, in classical, in classical electromagnetic theory, the energy of a dipole in an external field. There's things about this formula that always bothered me when I was a student, and I, maybe if I have time I'll tell you what the resolution of those things are. But in any case, this is, this is what's usually done. And so it's a guess that we can take this over as a potential energy into a Hamiltonian, either classically or quantum mechanically. If we do this classically, you'll, you'll get the correct you'll get the correct force on the on the particles. So that certainly works classically. And remember, we did this in the case of the stern gerlach apparatus to understand how the beam splits into two. Uh, in any case, this means that for a charged particle, uh, the Hamiltonian, including the spin, ought to be the the usual Hamiltonian we've discussed so far, which is p minus q over c a, plus the square plus q phi. This is in an external electromagnetic charged particle in an external electromagnetic field divided, described by potentials a and phi. But if we want to include the spin as well, we need to put it with a minus sign p dotted into v. The v, of course, is the general function of position and time, as, as are the potentials the a and the phi. 
in the view is being, in the view itself is proportional to the spin operator. So, so the ultimate Hamiltonian depends on uh, the, you might say the fundamental observables are the position hidden in the phi's and the x, the a's and the, and the phi's, and also the b's, that's the x variable, the momenta, as well as the spin, which is hidden inside here. All right. Uh, now, if the particle is neutral, then uh, it simplifies quite a lot, and you just get p squared over 2m uh, minus a mu dot b. So this is, for example, the Hamiltonian for a neutron moving in, in, in a magnetic field. Now, for the rest of the lecture today, we're going to simplify this even further and ignore the spatial degrees of freedom. Uh, this would be appropriate if the particle in question is, let's say, got a wave function which is localized, and the magnetic field is slowly varying, so the magnetic field is nearly constant over the spatial extent of the particle. So there's an x and t here. And if that's true, then we can, in fact, ignore the spatial extent, and we just have a magnetic field which, which depends on time. Of course, it doesn't have to depend on time, but it may. And also, likewise, we can ignore the effects of the, the kinetic energy because, because if there's no x dependence, it becomes effectively a, a free particle. So uh, let's uh, decouple from the spin. So just to concentrate on spin degrees of freedom, for the rest of the day, we'll take the Hamiltonian to the magnetic moment the dotted with the magnetic field, which we will allow in general to depend on time. Right. Now, now uh, plugging in the expression for the magnetic moment in terms of the spin, becomes minus the g factor times the charge of the 2mc uh, times, uh, times the spin operator dotted into the magnetic field. And I'm going to take this entire quantity here and define it to be gamma, just to give it a name, a brief name. I'll summarize it up here. Gamma is equal to minus g times q over 2mc like this. And so the Hamiltonian then becomes H is equal to gamma times the magnetic field B, which in general is a function of time dotted in the spin. This is the appropriate Hamiltonian for, dis for discussing spin evolutions in, in, uh, in cases in which uh, the particle is, uh, in spatial degrees of freedom, the particle are not important. All right. Now, so the Hilton space operator on the right hand side is spin. B is just a set of vector of ordinary numbers, and so is gamma. So H is an operator of the same kind. And in particular, the Hamiltonian now acts on this Hilbert space for the spin, which is this space C2S plus 1, that is to say the wave functions are 2S plus 1 component uh, complex numbers. All right. Now, this is an example of a time dependent Hamiltonian. And I'll remind you in general that the unitary time evolution operator depends on two times, and the Hamiltonian depends on time, the initial and the final time. Uh, let me call this unitary time evolution operator t comma t0. I previously used the symbol u here because these operators are unitary, but I'll call it t now because I want to use u for rotation operators. So the Schrodinger equation is this, it's ih bar times partial respect to t, t to t comma t zero is equal to the Hamiltonian acting on, which I'll, is called indicate as a function of time, acting on t comma t zero like this. And this is, then becomes the same thing as gamma times b dotted into s, uh, t of t comma t zero like this. All right. Uh, in general, it's not easy to solve. This is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And in general, it's not easy to solve these equations. In fact, you obviously can't solve it unless you know explicitly how B depends on time. But there are some general statements that can be made about that, regardless of how the magnetic field depends on time. In particular, let's consider this. This, uh, this is the Schrodinger equation with a time evolution operator. Let's consider solving this over a small time step. We just use a, an effect a Taylor series expansion to make a small time step. So here's the idea. We'll take t of t plus delta t comma t zero, where the delta t is small. And this is going to be equal to t of t comma t zero plus delta t times the derivative. And the derivative is dividing by ih bar is given by the 
Schrodinger equation here. So I need to multiply the right, divide the right hand side by i h bar. So this is going to be with a minus sign, minus i over h bar times gamma times b, uh, time, which is a function of time in general, divided into the C and S, multiplying on the T of T times <coughs> zero. Uh, and this should have been multiplied times delta T. So in first order in delta T, that's the time, the small time step. Now t comma t zero is a common factor here. We can take out to the right, and if you write this this way, it's identity minus i over h bar gamma delta t. <coughs> and by the way, for the magnetic field, let me break this up into the magnitude, which I'll call b of t times its direction. I'll call b hat of t. So b hat is a unit vector. Then we get b of t here times b hat of t. Divided into the spin, and this whole thing multiplies t of t times t zero. And this identity I should just write as one because it's the unit operator. Uh, unit operator. If you have a time dependence on b vector, and you're going to write it in terms of a scalar and a and a yeah vector, um, don't you don't doesn't just one of those need a time dependence? Well, it had a key because your magnetic field could have a constant direction that be changing, its magnitude could be changing. You could just crank up the current in the coils. Then, then, the, then, the, then the V vector wouldn't change, but the V magnitude would. On the other hand, you could have it changing in direction as well as magnitude. So in general, they're both functions. Uh, all right. The interesting thing about this, uh, this operator in the square brackets is that it's an infinitesimal rotation operator. That's to say we can write it this way as I can write this way is, um, uh, is, is I can write it in the form of mu uh, of an operator about an axis v hat by an angle which I'll call omega t, omega delta t, excuse me, or omega something has dimensions of frequency multiplying t times t by t zero. And the reason I know that is that if we take delta t to be small, so the angle is small, we can write this, this rotation operator in small angle form. And that's the same thing as 1 minus pi over h bar times omega delta t times the axis v hat dotted into the angular momentum, which in this case is the spin. And so by comparing this small angle expression for u with the quantity of the square brackets up here, what we see is, is that omega is equal to gamma times v, the magnitude of the magnetic field. So there's a frequency which appears, which is gamma, gamma times d, the strength of the magnetic field. And uh, the result is, is that, is that uh, the result is, is that in order to go from the time evolution operator one time t to the next successive time step, we multiply by a rotation operator which uses the instantaneous axis and the instantaneous frequency omega for the for the magnetic field. Uh, I didn't put. Let me rewrite this to emphasize that omega, since d depends on t in general, omega does also gamma d of t. Omega here in general is a function of time, and so is the axis. In fact, you can multiply the two together. Let's call omega of t times p hat of t. Let's define this to be omega vector of t, time dependent angular momentum vector. You find time dependent angular momentum vectors in classical uh, rigid body theory, for example. And what it means is that the evolution of the system can be thought of as a composition of a large number of small angle rotations, where you've got, at some time you've got a, a, an axis and a small angle omega delta t, and you apply that small angle rotation, then at a later time the axis and angle change a little bit, and the frequency change a little bit. You apply that rotation, the next delta t, you've got another one, you apply that one. And so by, you, by multiplying operators like this, these small angle uh, unitary rotation operators, you can build up t at some final time in terms of what t was at the initial time. And because the product of rotation operators is always a rotation operator, the net effect of this is, is that the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation for a spin in the magnetic field is always a rotation operator. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to figure out what the axis and angle is of the final rotation because the composition of things that are changing in time. But at least we know it's a rotation operator, and it does in fact have some axis and some angle. It also has other angles if you want to compute that. All right.
Um, if you remember rigid body theory in classical mechanics, there's a certain point where you can solve the Euler equations and you get the angular velocity as a function of time. Once you've got that, then if you want to find the orientation of the rigid body, you have to do an integration, which is exactly like this. It's a combination <coughs> of large numbers of small, uh, small angles in which, the act, in which the angular velocity vector is changing both in direction and in magnitude as a function of time. This is exactly the same, same picture. In fact, this is simpler because here we don't have to solve the Euler equations in order to find how the angular velocity vector changes as a function of time because it comes directly from the magnetic field, which we're assuming is given. All right. So within a proportionality factor, which is gamma, the magnetic field itself gives you the angular velocity you see as a function of time. All right. Uh, so that's a basic fact that uh, the solution of all of these uh, uh, problems involving the evolution of spins in magnetic fields is always a rotation operator. No. What about uh, let's look at some other cases where we can actually solve things. The simplest case where you can really solve it is the one in which the magnetic field is constant. Let's call it constant in time, space and time. In this case, the uh, in this case, the Schrodinger equation for the time evolution of operator. Now, since it's constant in time, it means the Hamiltonian is independent of time. Instead of writing a, a two-time evolution operator, I'll just turn it into a single time, which is the elapsed time. So in this case, the Schrodinger equation for t is, is this IH bar of the time derivative of t of t is equal to gamma times b0 times b hat by the spin s times t of t, like this. Now this equation is now easy to solve because the, this prefactor here does depend on time. What you get is that t of t is the exponential of minus i over h bar uh, times gamma t, gamma, gamma, times t times gamma d naught times b hat got into the s. This, this is assuming that t of t is the identity of t equals zero. And if we write omega naught is equal to gamma b naught, that's the same conversion factor between magnetic fields and frequencies that I was using in the previous board, then this can be written this way as a unitary uh, rotation operator with an axis of b naught. That's what this b is axis B naught and an angle which is uh, omega naught T like this. It's a very simple result. It means pictorially that if I have a magnetic field B naught which is constant in magnitude and direction pointing like this, then the time evolution of the system consists of a rotation about that axis by an angle which is omega naught T. So for example, it means that the state vector at some time t is equal to this rotation, v naught comma omega omega naught t applied to the rotation of time, but it's applied to the state vector at the initial time. Uh, let's take a look at the expectation value of spin as a function of time. This is something that uh, is is seen experimentally. Uh, uh, frequently seen experimentally in expectation value of spin because you have a large number of atoms and you're really averaging over all of them. Uh, and uh, let's just call this for short, let's call this the expectation value of S as a function of time. Uh, and let's call this, this U thing here, let's just call this U naught, like this. So this becomes U naught applied to psi naught. The knot on the u dot refers to the axis and angle. Let me just call it u instead of u dot. It's the time evolution operator. So plugging in for psi t in terms of psi zero, this becomes psi of zero sandwiched around u dagger spin s u psi of zero, <coughs> referring things back to the initial time. And now what you've got is a rotation operator conjugating an angular momentum operator. 
And this is why I was telling you about those Android formulas, because that's just what they tell you is what happens when you do such a conjugation. Uh, this was written in general form, where J is any angular momentum, and U is the rotation operator generated by the angular momentum. When you do this conjugation, it's equivalent to just rotating the angular momentum vector as a three vector by the classical rotation. And this gets applied directly here so that this uh, product of three operators in this matrix element turns into the corresponding classical rotation with the same axis B0 at and the same angle omega 0 at applied to the spin operator S. Now this classical rotation is a three by three matrix of numbers. They depend on time, but they're just numbers. They're not operators. They don't act on spin states or anything. Whereas S, of course, is a consists of operators that do act on spin states. So this rotation matrix, which is appearing inside this matrix solvent, can actually be taken out. And the result is that I can write it this way. It's that same rotation matrix, B hat 0, omega 0, T, applied to the expectation value of spin in the initial state. Expectation value is, of course, just a, a vector of ordinary numbers, C numbers. <coughs> so now you've got a, just a 3 by 3 matrix multiplied 3 by 3 matrix of ordinary numbers. Anyway, we can summarize all of this by saying that the expectation value of spin as a function of time is the classical rotation R about the axis B hat with the frequency or angle omega 0 t uh, acting on or multiplying onto the expectation value of spin in the initial time. And what it shows is, is that if your initial spin, expectation value of spin, is some vector pointing off in some direction like this, then the effect of the solving the Schrodinger equation is that this thing uh, goes around, sweeps out a cone like this, moving in a, uh, moving in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, the direction is counterclockwise if gamma is positive. Uh, gamma, I'll remind you, is minus g times q over 2 mc. So if uh, we're talking about an electron, so the Q is also negative, and that makes gamma positive. So for an electron, the, the expectation value spin rotates in a counterclockwise direction about the direction of the magnetic field. If it were a positive particle, it would rotate the other way, just changing the sign of gamma. OK, so that's the uh, simple case, the simplest possible case of, <coughs> of the motion of spins and magnetic fields. Let's now turn to a more complicated case, which is the one that appears in magnetic resonance experiments. The idea of magnetic resonance experiments is that you have a strong background magnetic field, which I'll call V0, is its magnitude V0 times its unit vector V0 hat, and this is a constant and uniform. And it's uh, considered to be a strong background field, yes. So I understand uh, that when we have these expectations, uh, you know, in, the, in that box equation on the top board, yeah. uh, expectation, uh, and then we have a matrix multiplying the expectation, and the expectation is can be considered as a, as a, as a three tuple, you know, uh, a three numbers. So that equation, I, I, I sort of understand what you're saying, but I, what, is the, what is the matrix R multiplying an operator S actually? What does that really mean? Well, that, what this means is, is that if I, to, if I want to take a component of this, this is the same thing as the sum on J of Rij times Sj. That's the ith component of the, of the result. So it's a linear combination of the, of the spin vectors. It's a, still a vector because there's an index of i here. So, uh, so this part doesn't bother you. It's a part up here I had, right? Yes, yes. All right. So, uh, look, I have an equation that, that has vectors on both sides. Here's here's a spin inside, and here's this rotated spin. Let me write this out more explicitly. Psi of t, si psi of t, is equal to psi zero. So I'm on J, R I J, S J, psi zero. Does that help? So the R I J's are just numbers. 
and uh, they, they're not operators, they don't act on the state. So this summon, summon all right, Jack, bring out. That is, so this and is then this formula I have here is just an abbreviated version of that, of that. So S is just a vector of operators and then you're multiplying by a matrix. Yeah, yeah, but it's interesting, you see when you conjugate with the rotation operators, these are really operators. So these act on, these act on the part. S sort of has two kinds of uh, characters. It has, first of all, an index, I equals one, two, three. It's a vector in ordinary space. But it also has, it also has, it also is an operator. So if you regard it as, put it in a, put it in a basis, as a matrix. As we say, it's a vector of a vector of matrices. That's how the poly matrices are viewed. And um, so it's a matrix aspect of this, it acts on the wave functions, and then it's a vector index, which is acted upon by these the R things. Does that help? All right. So to go back to magnetic resonance experiments, the basic idea is, that is, is to begin with is that you have a strong magnetic field. Uh, so that uh, spin persists in this magnetic field with a, with a corresponding frequency, and we call it a mega naught, it's defined as gamma times B naught. And gamma there is before, is minus Q times minus G times Q over 2 in C. And we'll assume that this is positive just for the sake of, of uh, if you want to worry about it would be positive for a negative particle, and if you want to worry about the other side, it's best to go through the equations again and rethink the pictures because it changes the directions in various vectors. All right, so we've got this magnetic field, and here's the unit vector B0 half of the same thing. Now, uh, typically, this frequency omega 0, you can think of as being a high frequency, it could be in the gigahertz range, something like that, uh, maybe, maybe 100 gigahertz even. Depends on the depends on circumstances. Uh, the um, uh, and uh, that's because this B zero is strong, Tesla field, something like that. Now, um, then what you do is you impose a another field which is a, which is perpendicular to the background field. And I call it B one. So B one is perpendicular to B zero. That's part of the requirements. Also, B one is time dependent. And it has time dependent in such a way that it has a frequency which I'll call omega 1. I'll show you explicitly the time dependence I have in mind in just a moment. But in any case, it's, got a, it's a time dependence with a time dependence periodic with a certain frequency of omega 1. And this notation is tricky, and I think this part of the next is hard uh, to follow, which is that omega 0 is the precession frequency in the background field. That depends only on the magnitude of the strong background magnetic field. Omega 1 is the frequency of the time dependence of B1 and is independent of the magnitude of B1. In practice, what one does is for B1 is you apply some RF oscillating frequency uh, uh, to, to the system. Uh, at the same time, there's a strong uniform background static field. So this is a lower frequency. In fact, this is a, well, this is an RF frequency. It's applied here with the frequency of omega 1. All right. So uh, this is the D1. This is the basic, uh, basic setup here. Now, uh, on the other hand, the magnitude of D1 is, uh, is uh, normally taken to be much less than the magnitude of B0. So that the time-dependent field in the perpendicular direction is a small perturbation on the magnetic field, uh, background field. What one looks for, however, is one looks for resonance. That's to say, you try to make a, make a resonance between the frequency of the perturbation, which is omega 1, and the frequency of the natural motion of the background field, which is omega 0. And if you're on resonance or near resonance, then you get a, then a small effect builds up over time, and you get, actually get a large effect. So this is why the whole thing is called nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR for short. That's the general technique that's used. When it's electrons, they call electron magnetic resonance, nuclear magnetic resonance for nuclear particles. All right. Now, the particular time dependent magnetic field, V1, that I'd like to consider uh, today is one in which V1 rotates in a circle in, in a plane perpendicular to V0. So if this is the initial value of V1, we call it V10 at time 0, then at a later time, we have a, a V1 at time t. And this angle in here is omega one. This angle here is omega one t. Let's make it rotate in a counterclockwise direction. 
like this, going around and around with this frequency of omega-1. And we're going to be interested in the case in which omega-1 is of the same order of magnitude as omega-0, near to it, because this is the resonance condition. All right. Now, you can solve the equations for any values of the parameters, but these are the parameters that are most interesting from an experimental standpoint. So the Schrodinger equation now looks like this. It's IH bar DDT of the state vector I'll call psi. Can somebody tell me the time? Did I hear the bell? Just now. Yeah. Okay, let me write out the Schrodinger equation, then I'll stop. I lost my watch. Uh, so it's going to be uh, gamma times the total magnetic field, which is the zero vector plus the one vector, which is a function of time, got it into the spin vector of psi of t. And this V1 vector, which is rotating in this counterclockwise direction, we can write this as a classical rotation about the axis V0 hat with an angle which is omega 1t applied to the initial conditions of V10. So the, this classical rotation is doing this, like this, rotating, rotating the V10 swinging it around. So we capture the time dependence of the perturbing field by this classical rotation. And so this is the Schrodinger equation, which uh, next Monday I'll solve for you. Turns out it was an exact solution. Okay. Right. Um, I, before you go, I was going to ask you something. Um, I need to do a, another makeup because I lecture because I was away from for two. I missed two. Uh, is a Tuesday night at uh, seven to eight is still is that still a suitable time for everyone? It's all right. Okay, I'll I'll take a week in November. Some